Hey friends, you're listening to All Aboard the Dream Train, a dream storytelling podcast where stories and experiences created by the unconscious brain are retold by the waking brain. All right, y'all. Thanks again for listening. This is episode six of All Aboard the Dream Train. My name is Mason, and if this is your first time listening, uh, in a nutshell, each episode I interview a new guest and ask them a few questions about themselves, followed by some questions about their sleep habits and their sleeping situation, and then they tell us a few stories about their dreams and how those dreams affected them in real life and their takeaway from those dreams. Before I start today, I got a quick story to go over. Um, But before I do that, I just want to let anybody that's listening know that if I ever decide to talk more than like 10 minutes about myself, I'll definitely give you a heads up so you can skip forward. Um, I consume a lot of podcasts and nothing grinds my gears more than the first half an hour of the podcast. The hosts are just talking about literally nothing that has to do with the actual topic of the podcast. So you have my word. I promise I won't do that to you. And if I do, I will definitely give you a heads up so you can skip forward. So on my days off, I like to get up early and go to the gym in the morning. Uh, One of my favorite things to do is sit in the sauna. Uh, It's just a great way to wake up. Anyways, I'm leaving the gym. I get into my truck and I'm about to start it up. And this gentleman asked me for a ride. And mind you, I'm on the third story of this parking garage and we're at a gym and he's like sweaty and is asking me for a ride and I politely decline I just told him no uh, I got place I got something to do um, and like when he asked that I knew I like had this gut feeling that something was weird and something was wrong uh, like when I my eyes met his um, I could just tell what was off I was scared anyways um, he kind of like turns away and starts walking away Um, down the stairs of this parking garage so I start up my truck and drive down to the bottom floor as quick as I can and I go to exit and I run into there's like six or seven cop cars with like probably nine cops with their hands on their guns and tasers drawn there's a a canine there and right as I'm kind of like stopping the gentleman that asked me for a ride walks out of the the stairwell starts walking away and one of the cops kind of squints as he's like looking at him and eventually he's like that's the guy and this guy just books it takes off running and anyways I can't get out of this parking garage because I'm like blocked in but uh eventually they kind of took off I got I got past him and I was able to get out of there but I look on my phone um later on Twitter and I follow PDX alerts, which is like the local cop, um, police scanner type, um, Twitter account. And like, it was like right in that area around the same time. And it reads Portland police are in a foot chase with the guy that pulled a knife on someone area, Northeast 40th and Halsey described as a male, all black clothing, white shoes, bald with a hair on the sides, like a cul-de-sac. I don't know what the cul-de-sac means, but regardless, uh, I was like right I was like right there with this dude. Uh he probably ditched his knife is my guess uh or else he probably would have I don't I don't know what would have happened. I mean, he was like desperate um and like cornered in a parking garage. He was definitely at like a 3 or 4 Grand Theft Auto wanted stars. But I got to thinking like things could have been a hell of a lot worse had he decided to use that knife on me. Um You just never know what's going on in people's heads and that stuff is like all around us but then i also got to thinking like i wonder what that dude dreams about like that dude definitely dreams for sure it's probably a lot different from yours or mine um but like those cops too those cops you know have a extremely stressful job and a lot of them i'm sure suffer from ptsd or um you know nightmares or you know stressful dreams So I guess the point that I'm trying to make is everybody's stories about their dreams are just as unique as them. And my goal with this podcast is to just get a wide variety of stories from people from all walks of life. And I feel like there's no better way to capture those stories um, other than 
coming straight from the person that experienced them. And um, maybe I'll just start saying yes every time someone asks for a ride, but they have to agree to answer some questions about their sleep habits and sleep situations. And of course, tell a story about their dreams. All right, moving along here. On today's episode, my guest's name is Jasmine. Jasmine works in the death care industry. If that word was new to you, it's new to me as well. Uh, That just means companies and organizations uh, that deal with funerals, cremations, burials, and memorials. Her first story involves her significant other and kind of the process of embalming. So if you're sensitive to um, details with the human body, and if you're a little bit squeamish, you might want to fast forward. I find it fascinating, but I get why some might be squeamish. And her second story is just literally like it's out of a horror film. Um, while you're listening to that one and actually all, all of the stories that you hear on this podcast, I want you to really think about um, the details that they're describing and really try to put yourself into the scene that they're setting. All right, let's get to it. My conversation with Jasmine. Uh, uh, Just open up these questions and then we'll kind of get into it. Will you just start by um, telling anybody that's listening your name and location? Mm -hmm. My name is Jasmine. I'm uh, living in Seattle, Washington. Cool. How long have you been in Seattle for? Uh, I've been here for about four going on five years, but... I still feel really new. Sometimes I, like, I'm surprised that it's been that long. <laughs> so I came from Phoenix. So it's like the polar opposite of Phoenix. I've only been to um, some, somewhere my, my buddy was going to college at. I only went there once in February, and it was like, it was great seeing that contrast where, like, you leave Portland and it's gray, cloudy, rainy, and then mm-hmm. perfect the whole time, like 80s, but... Probably Flagstaff. Yes. Is that where you went? It was somewhere close to that. Yeah. Because there's I a big can't... university in Flagstaff. Okay. But yeah, yeah that sure. drive is crazy because it's just like flat nothingness until you get to <laughs> like northern Oregon. Mm-hmm. And then it's just all sorts of mountains. Yeah. What are your hobbies or your passions? Um, well, hobbies... I I like to draw a lot. Uh, I also uh, have been ballroom dancing for a number of years, although I haven't done it recently. It's just hard to find the time with work and everything. Sure. Uh, and then my passions, I've been really lucky to be able to like forge a career in an area that I'm really passionate about. Um, and it kind of ties into the the dream that I'm going to talk about or both of them actually but I worked in uh, I've worked in death care for quite a while now I at first mm-hmm. worked in a funeral home and then I've worked for a couple tissue banks and I don't know I just really enjoy the work and not in any kind of like morbid way but it feels uh, yeah. impactful and it feels like important work and I really like anatomy yeah, it's super important and super like it. It takes a certain person to be good at that, you know. Um, mm-hmm. Absolutely. Dealing with, dealing with a lot of emotion and. What's your favorite part about your job? Um, I've done like different roles. I've well, I've worked in different roles in death care, so I have like you know different favorite parts about each of those positions, but I really do find like human anatomy to be fascinating and it's really, especially when I was going to school, it was really interesting um, to like look at my book in anatomy and then go to work and then see it like right in front of my face and unfortunately you know, every kind of interaction you have like that, it means that someone has died but you know, another part of the job that I enjoy is you know, making sure that for the families or for the donor families or for the recipient families, you're doing something that's going to, you know, help them, you know, gain closure or feel a little bit more comfortable with like a really unfortunate situation. And that means a lot to me too. Um, You know, because I think that just that surrender of control of someone's dad or boyfriend or daughter or whoever that's a really difficult thing and you want to make sure that the person who's 
taking custody of that person is, you know, like an ethical, passionate person, I guess, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Dang. You obviously like dealing with people or are good at it because um, I feel like that if you weren't good with talking with people or having a, an emotional intelligence, you've like perfected that craft or gotten really good at I try to. <laughs> I yeah. think that there's definitely moments where I still like I'm at a loss of what to say because sometimes the situations are just really extreme and you really don't know what to say. But, you know, as you kind of like, you know, go through, you know, different experiences and you talk to, you know, different people in different kind of situations, you really learn like how to be like that, it's a specific kind of communication, I think, talking to somebody who's grieving. It's not the same way that you would, you know, answer a sales call. Hopefully right. not. <laughs> yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah, no, yeah, it does. Um, I experienced that with this podcast a little bit. It's like some of these some of these stories are like super intimate. And, mm -hmm. you know, like I don't really know how to, you know, I just like thank them for being open, you know. Um, yeah. But it's hard to like you know you don't want to go into too much detail or I guess right you just, right you don't like, want to lay on too heavy but you still want to be you know compassionate and understanding yeah I yeah. get that yeah totally uh and how would you describe yourself mm, I think that I, I definitely think I'm empathetic I think that I'm uh a curious person I don't know. It's hard. I don't describe myself very often, but yeah. I think that I am inquisitive and I'm compassionate. I've said that word a lot, but. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to go into some sleep questions now. Absolutely. Um, what helps you relax or unwind at the end of the end of the day? Okay. I'm going to put my phone right here so I can read along to you. I'm not like texting and talking. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. No problem. Um, this one is something that I've had to like really work on. I have a sleep disorder and I also don't have very good sleep hygiene. So sometimes like relaxing and unwinding is a hard thing for me to do. But it's something I've worked on because it's also something that can help the quality of my sleep like long term. Mm -hmm. So lately, at least I've been trying to shut the TV off and I've been doing like the guided meditations and those actually work pretty decently, I think. Uh, is it just like something on your phone? Is it like YouTube? Where do you find those at? Um, yeah, a couple of them I found on YouTube. Um, there's also like on, I think I just found one on like the podcast app. There's like people that have whole podcasts where all they do is oh. like, yeah, they do guided meditations. They do ASMR, although I'm not really into ASMR. They have everything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I really like the binaural beats. Have you heard of those? Oh, my friend told me about those, but I haven't actually looked into it, so I don't really have a clue what that is. Yeah, you should check them them out. They're, I mean, everybody's a little bit different. Some people don't react to them, but like, it's kind of the same thing as ASMR. I think I don't mm -hmm. I don't know about ASMR. I've never experienced what that does, but the binaural yeah. does something, uh, and I can like feel vibrations. It's pretty cool. Oh, that's cool. So it's like some like some note or some tone that like affects people in a, like a certain way. That's cool. Yeah, there's that. Yeah, yeah. You should check it out. It's it's interesting for sure. <clears throat> Do you have any sleep aids? Um, sleep aids. Uh, I mean, I, 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 tr I try, I try to avoid like medication, but sometimes mm -hmm. I do end up taking medication. I take melatonin a lot. Mm -hmm. Um. I, besides that, uh, nothing really, no eye masks or anything like that, just melatonin, which I probably take too much, but, <laughs> but it I works, it, so. <laughs> it, it definitely does. Yeah, um, I remember, um, I didn't think melatonin worked at first because I thought that it was just like, you know, uh, holistic medicine, like hoo-ha, and my dad right. took it, and he had these gummies. 
And I don't know why, but like I just ate a gummy because I wanted to eat a gummy and I was like, well, it's not going to work anyway. And then I like <laughs> fell asleep while I was painting my toenails. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. Yeah, good thing you weren't driving a car or something. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's really effective, uh, I think. Yeah. This might be something you don't want to answer. Do you mind me asking what your um, your sleep condition is? Um, yeah, it's it's an ongoing thing. I saw a sleep doctor in Phoenix, and they said that they suspected that I was narcoleptic. And then out here, I actually saw a sleep doctor, and I did a 24-hour sleep study, and he said that he thought that I had sleep apnea, but I also was in range for narcolepsy. But they wanted to treat the sleep apnea first so they set me up for the CPAP machine and he's like we'll see you in 30 days and if these this part of like the things you're dealing with haven't improved then we can move on but hmm. from what he said there's not really like a great treatment for narcolepsy especially since I don't have like the cataplexic episodes where people just like fall it's yeah. mostly a lot of sleep paralysis and then I like I fall asleep often but mm -hmm. I don't, you know, and I don't have a hard time falling asleep at night, but I have like poor quality of sleep and I wake up a lot of times and I have like, I th I don't know, they, they call like hypnagogic hallucinations, but they're just yeah. like really vivid dreams, but it's like happening like where you actually are. It's really interesting to describe. Um, wow. But I couldn't stand <laughs> the CPAP machine. Mm -hmm. So I returned it and I have to make an appointment to go see him eventually, but I've just been really busy with work. So it's one of those things where I've been like dealing with these uh, symptoms for so long that it's not really like, I mean, it's annoying, but it's not like it's bothering me any more than it has for the past like 10 years. So it's easy to like mm -hmm. push off, but I do plan on going back. For sure. Yeah. It's all too easy. I mean, dealing with doctors and stuff especially with the busy schedule like you said i think everybody can relate to that it's just like ugh. and then and there's so many hoops to jump through also i remember reading somewhere that there's like some like sleep apnea like diagnosing craze happening because one of the things mm. i mentioned to him is like i haven't always snored but i've always had these things mm -hmm. and the first time i went in um when i still lived in phoenix so years ago they didn't mm -hmm really mention or they didn't mention like ruling out sleep apnea yeah. but now um they did mention it and then another friend of mine is having a sleep study and that's what they're going in for her too even though she's not really much mm. of a snore so i wonder if they're getting kickbacks or something but i'm not gonna get too into that <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah interesting huh <laughs> do you uh do you share your bed or do you have it all to yourself um i share my bed i have uh, a boyfriend um and sharing like a sleeping space isn't always easy for me but um after after like becoming comfortable with the person it's actually really nice to have mm. someone there especially when I have when I'm like having a uh, sleep paralysis like if mm. I whimper or something like he knows to like wake me up and honestly that's like a godsend sometimes wow yeah does do they um do they have any funny like sleep habits or do they do anything funny in their sleep mm, he definitely does that thing where he like I don't think he realizes it but he'll inch closer and closer to me until I'm like up against the wall like this <laughs> so that's all I can think of yeah you just push him push him out of the way uh usually I just deal with it <laughs> yeah <laughs> Uh, how many hours would you say you get of sleep on average? Mm, I mean, I try to get as close to like eight or nine as I can. Um, mm -hmm. But I do wake up an awful lot. So even if I get eight hours collectively, I still, I, I feel like I end up missing out on like, you know, quality REM sleep. Yeah, totally. And is it, is it broken up or do you feel like you like once you get into that you get in the zone and is it real consistent or is it broken up for you um like once I, are you asking like if i if i get to like a deep sleep will i stay there 
Yeah, do you wake up uh, like multiple times throughout the night? Yeah, pretty consistently I do. Um, and I feel like I do have like REM sleep. I don't think it's that I don't have any REM sleep. I think that I enter like REM pretty quickly. I think that's like one of the things about um, narcolepsy. But mm. it's just I feel like when you're being woken up, I feel like I wake up at least two to three times a night. Mm. Sometimes more, sometimes less, but I can't remember the last time I've like gone to sleep and then woken up eight hours later. Yeah, yeah, totally. Makes sense. And then your favorite sleeping position? Mm. Uh, I like to sleep, what is it they call? What is it prone on your stomach like this? Oh, okay. Which, which probably isn't good for like staying asleep either, but it's comfortable. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if there's like one that there's one that's better than the others, but you know, I don't know how true that is. Yeah. I mean, I understand why like sleeping on your back wouldn't be good for, you know, quality sleep cuz you you know, you've got like the weight of yourself, I guess. I don't know. It seems like people snore more on their back. I don't know why, but mm -hmm. I guess yeah. you can see that. Yeah, it's interesting. And then uh what interests you in dreams? Um, I just think they're really interesting. I, you know, the fact that we don't really know, like, why we dream or have any, like, concrete reasons, it just, it, it makes the whole thing, like, very mysterious, and I find that appealing. And it's also kind of like a window into, like, your subconscious, mm -hmm. you know, and I don't really buy into the whole, like, you know, when you dream about teeth falling out, it means this, but I do think that there's a lot of, like, insight you can gain on like your current state of like mind and mm. being with like you know through like looking through your dreams or listening to other people's dreams it's just I don't know it's kind of a cool outside look in um so even when I have like nightmares I mean there's definitely sometimes where I'm glad to wake up mm -hmm. but then at the end of it like I'm always glad that I had the dream if that makes sense oh yeah absolutely yeah, they're very, very strange, but like you said, also just super interesting. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Kind of a different world that we only get a peek inside of, and it's not when we want to or we can't really control when it happens. It just happens. Yeah, and there's something really neat about that, actually. I hadn't thought about it like that until you said that, you know, mm -hmm. this, you know in the way that we live, you know, in this modern time, everything is so like controlled. Mm -hmm. It's it's kind of interesting to have this thing where like you really don't have any control over it. Yeah. Yeah. Do you remember the movie is like Monkey Bone from like the early two thousands? I don't. I'm actually really bad with movies. Um... Well, there's like a movie. Brendan Fraser is in it, but he is like in purgatory because he's in a coma and there's this bar there and then like on the tv it's like people's dreams you can watch different people's dreams i thought that was oh. kind of cool was it monkey what monkey bone a bong <laughs> i love that <laughs> b-o-n-e oh i totally wrote down bong <laughs> <laughs> that sounds pretty cool too yeah i'm interested what google would say about <laughs> monkey bong <laughs> I'm going to avoid that one for now. <laughs> Maybe later. Uh, cool. Well, that's going to do it for my questions. Um, so at this point, I'm just going to kind of hand it over to you. Just give us a quick preface or whatever information you need to throw in there. Um, and then tell your story and then kind of your takeaway from that story. Okay. Um, I have them written down and I tried to pick dreams that I thought had a theme and were also like more cohesive because some dreams can get like really out there but mm -hmm. I don't know uh the first one I'm going to talk about I guess is a specific dream but also uh, a reoccurring dream I talked about it um online but I think that working in death care you know does affect people in different ways and I feel like for the most part I've been able to, you know, not be like emotionally affected on a day to day, you know, there's intense moments at work, but 
for the most part, I've been able to stay pretty well rounded. Uh, but one of the ways that it has affected me, which sounds expected, but it's a, it's 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 so odd to me, um, is in my dreams. I feel like, you know, I've dream I've dreamt about death before. I'm sure that everyone's dreamt about death before, but before I worked uh in the funeral industry or in death care, I would just dream that somebody had died. I didn't actually see them face to face. And now that I have had exposure um mm -hmm. to to lots of dead people. <laughs> right. Um I I've started to I've started to have like very vivid and realistic dreams about corpses whenever I have dreams about death. Yeah, so I I guess if anyone is sensitive to that, I should start off by saying, you know, uh it's pretty detailed. When I do have um a dream that impacts me heavily and, and like one way or the other, I'll mm -hmm. try my hardest to like get up and write it down when it's fresh. And I try and be as detailed as possible so that I can remember it well. But obviously that's going to come across here too. And I don't want to like offend anybody. So mm -hmm. I guess that's cool. just my trigger warning. <laughs> Appreciate that. <laughs> so I was talking about how uh, things uh, like my death dreams kind of changed a lot once I started to see a lot of corpses. Um, now, whenever I dream of death, there's almost always a hyper-realistic body that goes along with it. This really doesn't bother me when I dream of random dead people that I don't know in real life. Uh, the gore doesn't really get to me because I feel like I've been, you know, not desensitized, but it, to a certain degree desensitized towards that. Mm -hmm. um, it's when I dream of somebody that I know being dead, which has happened multiple times and it's pretty disturbing. Um, most recently, I had a dream that my boyfriend died. Um, and in the dream, I was still working uh, at a funeral home. So, of course, when we'd found out that he died, I wanted to be the one to take care of, you know, as many funeral, uh, funeral um, preparations as I could, mm -hmm. including embalming and then, like, funerary cosmetics. Uh, so in my dream, as what would happen in real life, um, he had to first go to the medical examiner's office. Since he's so young, it qualified, I guess, in my dream as like an unexpected death. So when he was delivered back to the funeral home, um, he had been, they call it posted, but it's post-autopsy. Um, so... When I got him onto the embalming table, there were cranial and thoracic incisions, which is, I think, what you see most often on, like, TV. There's, like, a cut right here and then the Y, um, you okay. know, but in real life, it's it's not quite as neat. Uh, they definitely don't sew you up after an autopsy, <laughs> so everything's just kind of exposed, um, and sometimes, like, the scalp is pulled back from the skull. Uh, so I saw that. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah, and also what happens in real life, or at least what I've seen happen almost every time is, you know, when they conduct the autopsy, if they remove organs uh, or any kind of like viscera, they'll put it in a bio bag. And when they're done, they will put the bio bag back into the um, like abdominal, abdo abdominal cavity and then... Yeah. That's just how they're presented to you. Uh, yeah. And most often what will happen is we will just sew the person up with that bio bag still with them. Um, uh -huh. So these were the preparations that I was going through in my dream. And I remember very vividly being uh, disturbed by how bloated he looked. And I mm. knew that it was from that bag you know also as you embalm people do tend to swell a bit uh mm -hmm. and it's just i don't know very uncanny i also sewed up his cranial incisions and i began washing his hair which he has very long hair and i remember running my fingers through his hair and catching like blood clots uh wow. and then having to work them out with my fingertips and that's kind of when it it hit me and it, it felt very real 
yeah. and a lot of times when I have these dreams, like they are so realistic that I'm convinced that they are real. Sometimes I think when you dream, you know that you're dreaming, but in these yeah. cases, almost always I'm convinced that's what's happening. Um, especially wow. because there's usually like sense of smell that goes along with it. And I've, I've never figured this out probably because, you know, when you're thinking back on it, instead of being there in the moment, like you're not really sure, but I've had so many dreams about corpses, uh, where like smell is like really key to the dream. Um, for example, I've had a dream, uh, where I was removing a decedent from a scene of death and he'd been decomposed. We call those decomps. And it's a very like sweet, rancid smell. Oh. And I remember smelling that, but I don't know if I actually smelled it or if I just had that reaction. But anyway, wow. as I was here with my boyfriend, that was that kind of irony smell of blood and then working out those blood clots, it hit me and I started whimpering or at least I assume I started whimpering because at that point um, my boyfriend woke me up and it was nice to see him alive. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. It's, it's very interesting to, you know, go from washing hair out of his, you know, his, his hair, like at blood out of his hair and him being dead to then, mm. you know, him being right in front of me alive. Yeah. yeah. So that, that, that's one dream. Um, and then there was another that I had picked out that I think shares kind of like the same themes. Uh, this one is just one dream. It's not, you know, kind of an amalgam of dreams like I just talked about, but it, is it okay if I continue? Yeah. 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 Um, I do, I would like to ask you, um, you, you went into, you know, the, the contrast of the dream and then waking up, uh, mm -hmm. Um, were you um do you remember like experience experiencing like any physical like sign like were you did you wake up um sweaty or was there any like sore or anything was there anything like anything um, that you noticed it, it's it was definitely very jarring I don't yeah. know if I can say like there were like physical things it was also kind of a warm night so I was mm -hmm kind of sweaty already yeah, yeah um but i mean there have been times where i've cried in my dream and i've cried in real life or i just i think that more than anything it's just like that adrenaline rush and you almost feel kind of shaky just because it was such a jarring experience if that makes sense yeah yeah and absolutely. then you know waking up with a start like that i'm sure only contributes <laughs> to that more yeah, for sure. I'm sure you hugged him a little, little tighter that that morning. No, I was like, "Get out of here!" No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was happy to see him alive. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> okay, um, I'm just gonna read this one word for word as I have it written. Um, okay, so in this dream, I was in both a metaphorical and literal house of death. It was in a permanent state of twilight, full of gray and sepia tones. It seemed like a prefabricated home, full top to bottom of clutter, filth, and decay. There was a greasy musk in the air from the rot of food and mold. There were two older, obviously unhealthy women, both plump and venous looking, moving through the house in some kind of depressed funerary celebration. Their friend had died. A third woman, uh, who was apparently the previous third tenant of this space, Begin to, oh, and they begin to put the body where the bodies go. The third woman's body started to levitate, uh, and it seemed to kind of float of its own volition through the cramped hallway into the kitchen, occasionally bumping things along the way. She floated outside onto the just as cluttered back porch and nestled onto somewhat of an empty space on a bench to a blue picnic table. The table was also yellowed with grease and looked green with the blue paint underneath and the grease on top. Hmm. Uh, there were also many festering bugs crawling on and in and out of it. As soon as the third woman rested on the bench, the bugs soon began to burrow into all the pores of her skin, which seemed to gape in anticipation of them. Uh, 
There were many feral cats that roamed the space, and one of them was weaving in and out of the walls of clutter and was caught by hand and by hand slaughtered. I heard its cries pierce the night, and somehow I could taste its blood in my mouth. The third old woman was now officially and ceremoniously put to rest. I asked a question. I don't remember exactly what it was, but I can guess based on the answer. I heard uh, the answer on the wind, um, which was but a weak and stifled breeze. The blood of the cat was needed to finish the ceremony, and it was revealed that I had been the one that killed it. Now I hear my father's disembodied voice calling out to me with a mournful lust. His voice is ghoulish, and a preternatural force moves my body and spirit out of the dark, cramped room. As I go from inside to outside, it seems as if the whole backdrop of a tightly cramped, disheveled, unnamed city lays before me out of nowhere. Mm. I am further backed on to the porch where the resting place of that third old woman is on the picnic bench in the back of the house. My body, haphazardly and by the will of some force triggered by my father's calling, whether that be him or some separate entity, is heavily laid and pressed down upon me, which is pressed down upon the body of the old woman. Her body is already shriveled like a mummy's, yet her skin is mush and collapsed between, uh, beneath the weight of my body. I can feel her against my face, her skin and flesh displacing beneath the weight of mine, while the weight of my father's will bears down on me, critically crushing us both. He explains telekinetically to me that I now belong here, and my soul begins to wither into nothingness as I am further crushed into the bench like a bug under a shoe. I can't breathe and I'm panicking. The putrid swell of the old woman's corpse, now in an advanced or in a further advanced state of decay, whew, sorry, okay. fills my nose as the world around me starts to cave in. I must have started to whimper because my boyfriend woke me up. Wow. Yeah. So, and this one was really weird for me because I don't have like a negative relationship with my father, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. but that's been kind of. I guess what made it so interesting to me and I think that other people have had this experience as well where you know people that they know in real life make these really unexpected uh like appearances in their dreams and play roles that they wouldn't you know you know what I'm saying like they have mm -hmm. bad dreams about people that they don't have bad relationships with yeah so. yeah that's that's interesting. It's interesting that that would like be put into our dreams. And it, it's hard to like know what to do when you wake up with that too. It's like, well, there was, there's no negativity towards this person or like between this person and I. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've read online, you know, just kind of other people's experiences, which mm -hmm. I really enjoy, like, you know, listening to other people's dreams as well. And it seems like I'm not the only person that's had that, you know, experience where they have like, you know, a dream where they have like a romantic relationship with a platonic friend or they mm -hmm. have like a fight, like a physical fight with their grandmother. Those are just like examples. Right, right. Yeah. Can you describe like the um, the setting uh, of like the picnic table was it like dark outside was it broad daylight yeah, it seemed like twilight it seemed like not really day or night it was all it, the whole thing just had this overwhelming fear a feel of just like emptiness you know what I mean mm -hmm. everything felt really hollow even though the house was so cluttered you know there was nothing substantial in the house you know yeah. everything was just kind of like in this state of decay and then the weather outside from what i can remember it was just like I, I, there was a lot of like sepia tones and like a lot of like gray where it was just this no time does that make mm. sense yeah yeah the hollow hollow feeling um that's an interesting way to describe it was it like did you feel in the house where did you feel like 
claustrophobic? Was it a feeling of being I, confined or? At first, I think I just didn't know what was going on. And I was just really curious to try and put together what was happening. Uh, it's been a while since I've had this dream. So I'm trying to put myself there now. But um, mm -hmm. I had, I had, I think, maybe ominous feelings, but I didn't feel claustrophobic until I was actually like pressed down on the bench. And I realized that like I was going to be crushed into non-existence pretty mm -hmm. much. Mm-hmm. Wow, yeah, that's that's wild. Um, and were the other characters um, like, were the other characters? How were they moving? Can you describe like maybe a little bit about how they? How yeah, they yeah, it was very like ethereal. Like they were almost maybe that's not the right like spectral. Do you know what I mean? The third woman, I didn't actually see her alive, but she was literally just like floating and I don't know if it was the other two women that were supposed to be controlling that or if she was putting herself to rest I I mm. didn't I wasn't able to figure that out but they I have a very specific memory were kind of like dancing and like mm. twirling as they were walking down the hall following like the other floating woman but it was very unnatural and then uh like like slow movements Hmm. Like they were very lethargic and very like, I don't know. It was interesting. Did you, did it feel like a, a really long dream or what, did you, did it feel like everything was kind of over and done pretty quickly? Yeah, it felt over and done pretty quickly. Um, I maybe like, it felt like maybe five to 10 minutes real time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah I don't know how long it actually was I feel like dreams are probably like a lot faster than we like recount them yeah um but it felt like five to ten minutes wow and then um what was your takeaway from from that I don't know it's, it's really hard for me to try and figure that one out you know it could have been stress related uh, because at the time I was under a lot of pressure and I hadn't talked to my dad in a while and he and I have a really close relationship. So I almost wonder if there was some kind of like, like feelings of guilt there that caused mm -hmm. it, or maybe he was just on my mind and I had like these negative thoughts of like, Oh, I need to call dad. And then that manifested into the dream of like this, like oppressive force, like punishing me for something I don't know that's all I can really yeah. come up with but it, it was really bizarre yeah absolutely um the um I kind of looked at looked it up a little bit and the fact that you can um recall like smells in your sleep um or in your dreams is uh from what it looks like it's like pretty rare I don't want to say that like it's a fact because I don't I have no idea but mm -hmm. um there's this website. Let's see, I was just looking it up. It's, uh, in fact, it's so infrequent that research on odors and dreams is choppy and, and incomplete at best. The first study was done in 1893 when Mary Witten, an instructor at Wesley College, analyzed dream diaries kept by two volunteers over, over a six to eight week period. <laughs> Her conclusions then followed up in 1896 showed that odors show up in an estimated 15% of dreams. A hmm. hundred years would pass before anyone thought to study the subject again. In 1998, researchers at McGill found that while as many as 20.9% of women had odorous dreams, the number was only 2% for men. Huh. That's interesting. Uh, yeah. More, yeah, more interesting, however, is the latest research, which shows that no, that not only are odorous dreams possible, but what you smell before your head hits the pillow may be behind whether you make up, maybe whether you wake up feeling happy or sad. Huh. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, it's one of those things I haven't been able to figure out, like, in the sense that, you know how they say, you know, when you don't when you have a dream where you're reading something, you're not actually reading it. You just know what it says already. Mm. I've always wondered if it's been one of those things because I remember having like very visceral like reactions to these smells. And then in my head, like 
in the dream I smelled it, but I don't know if it was just like my body or my brain like knows what the reaction to the smell is and that's how like I interpreted it in my dream or if it's your brain actually some way like simulating the smell like realistically in your dream I don't know yeah it's really that's interesting though right no it's very strange and I can relate um if you dig a little bit online uh people like like know the answer to like a mathematical problem or something in their dream and then you know like in real life they would have never been able to put that together so it's almost like memory banks deep deep within your brain that are like hidden that you know yeah uh, i don't doubt that yeah that makes sense it's just yeah it's just so wild some of the dreams that i've heard are just way out there like almost to where like did that really happen dude but <laughs> i mean it, you can't really make this stuff up you know you can but yeah uh, yeah, super interesting. So I do have a few questions regarding kind of your um, your work life mm-hmm. and how it relates to dreams. What do you think happens when we die? You know, um, it's funny that you mentioned that. I, I got into the funeral industry to begin with because I had like, I think, an unnatural fear of death. Mm-hmm. And I thought that exposure to it... Um, would help me with that and like find peace in that. I was also like, like very nihilistic at the time and I was afraid of non-existence. Um, so I was hoping that I would figure it out, but you know, exposure to corpses isn't really exposure to dying, you know, or it doesn't, you know, give you that actual experience at most. I think it just kind of makes you think about your own mortality. So I don't, I don't know. I feel like I've changed a little bit in what I believe in. I think that I'm a bit more spiritual now than when mm-hmm. I started. But essentially, the way I feel about it is I have no way of knowing until I get there. So I'm I've just kind of like made a deal with myself to stop stressing out and stop like worrying over it. And I'll just see then or not. You know, does that answer your question? It's kind of roundabout yeah. way of answering it. Sure. It definitely makes you more cautious, uh, and it definitely makes you more grateful. I think um, it's kind of weird because I I work uh, in a field where you encounter like death and grief every day, but I actually haven't lost anyone like close to me. Mm-hmm. So it's it's weird having so much exposure to something that you really haven't like experienced yet. Mm-hmm. But you can almost kind of like, um, there's a word for it, I think, but, you know, experience, well, experience it through like the people that are grieving. And it's just made me, you know, like very aware of like the risks in life that are easy to avoid that could, you know, potentially save you from that heartbreak. And it's also made me, you know, more grateful of the time that I do have with people that I know are eventually going to die you know, people like grandmas and grandpas and dads and moms, I think people like have it in their brains that they're always going to be there and like they really aren't. Right. Yeah. Life is way too short. I mean, Mm -hmm. you never know when that moment it is going to be, you know, so here's another question. Is there, um, a form of death that you see more, more often? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Most often people die from complications with old age. Um, I mean, that's, that's the vast majority of it. But like when you break people down into age groups, then different things become more common. Uh, When a young person dies, I find that it's usually like one of four things. It's like suicide, overdose, motorcycle accidents and then automobile accidents but motorcycle accidents are a lot more common or at least deaths from motorcycle accidents than like car accidents so and then those ones are pretty difficult and then also when you get into like the younger age group there's a lot of stillborns or things like that but um yeah so that's that's that although i've I've seen a lot of different ones yeah. it's weird when you get like the ones that aren't common because that's I think those brief or the those like rare um encounters kind of shake you out of that like desensitization and then you realize again like whoa um this is 
kind of heavy what I yeah. do every day. Yeah, it's like become super, super real. And it's just like, I can't yeah. even imagine. And I think it's good to have those, you know, every once in a while, like those really tragic ones. You know, of course, I wish that there was never a tragic death, you know, that occurred in the world. But yeah. I think that like exposure to those every once in a while is important for people in the industry because it is humbling. And I think that when you do something day in and day out, you really do get desensitized. But you have to like find some way to keep yourself grounded and realize like this might be, you know, Thursday and I've dealt with this every day since Monday and for years since then but this might be this mother's first time ever dealing with the death of a son you know so right. you have to stay humble I guess yeah absolutely yeah motorcycles scare the hell out of me I I don't know how people do it I don't know either. Yeah. I mean, another way I guess I've changed the way I live my life since then is I, I will not get on one now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's I mean, it's just it's not even about the person that's riding. It. It's it's everybody else. Exactly. And most fatal accidents occur in low speed residential neighborhoods. I mean, we not like residential, but low speed areas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it just it seems so bold to me, you know, just to put like this fleshy body on something that can go so fast and that's surrounded by these huge moving metal objects. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's terrifying. Um, <laughs> I, I drive trucks for a living and I think about that every day. You know, I drive over the past, like over like through Mount Hood and yeah, it's just like windy, narrow roads and any, mm -hmm. any turn could be the last one. Um, you know, there's, yeah. You can't help if someone veers off into your lane. It's just like very little room for error. Yeah, I can imagine driving something so so big and that you need such a head start to stop with. Yeah. Yeah. Well, don't get too into the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> or into into the audiobook or whatever you're listening to. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> totally. No, that's totally true. You kind of went into it, but like when I think of death, like there's, um, there's a part to it where like, I think this is probably what happens after you die. And then there's a part like what I would like to have happen after I die. Mm -hmm. so like, you know, who knows, maybe like you die and it's, you know, I, I hate to say this cause it sounds so whack, but like complete darkness that uh, used to be a fear of mine actually yeah because i think that it's kind of impossible to comprehend like nothingness so that's yeah. what your brain like it goes to is like silence and like immobility mm -hmm. is that where you are sorry and i interrupted you no you nailed it no you totally nailed it I, I hate to say that that's what it is but uh what i would like to actually happen is like, I, I just want to come back as an animal, man, a, a bird or something, reincarnation. Mm -hmm. I mean, that just sounds way cooler. So like, I kind of just go with that idea. Yeah, yeah. That's kind of a gamble, though, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it really is. Yeah. But I mean, you can like, do bird things and fly around. That's true. Or do shark things. I mean, I don't know. Uh, yeah, there's like a 400-year-old shark they found or something. Did you see that? No. Yeah, yeah. That's so. insanely... Well, some, um, like sturgeon, they live insanely long lives. I just hope something like that happens. Yeah. And what do you think happens with your uh, consciousness? or? I mean, I really hope that something happens with it. You know, it yeah. would just be fun to see like maybe the universe you know in more of like a macroscopic way you know mm -hmm. than we can look at it right now or to be able to like experience you know whatever that like yeah it would be nice if there was a soul it'd be nice if like there was consciousness after this I guess I I you know I'm happy with what I have here and what I've seen but it would just be great fun I think to see more you know yeah yeah, totally. I hope so. You know, Let's and also, our... it really would be nice to get to see everyone again that does die. Yeah, totally. 
let's cross our fingers um, and hope that it's not just black darkness. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if it is, I'm sure I'll remember this moment while I'm yeah. like, screaming in silence. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, that's awesome. Um, all right. Is there anything else you wanted to add? Um, that this was a lot of fun. I really appreciate the podcast. Cool. I've listened to a couple episodes and I cool. look forward to listening to more because I think it's a really awesome, awesome idea. Well, thank, thank you very much. And again, thanks for your time. Um, you know, if, if it weren't for, you know, folks like you that um, were down to tell me their story, like this wouldn't exist at all. So, uh, thank you. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Yeah, I look forward to hearing it. All right, friends, that's going to do it for episode six. I want to thank you again for listening. I hope you're enjoying the show. I really enjoy doing it. Um, it's a challenge, and it's a lot of fun talking to people that I otherwise wouldn't ever really talk to. Um, if you're enjoying things, uh, please like and subscribe uh, wherever you listen to this at. Um, also, I have a YouTube channel that I will periodically be putting videos of the conversations that I'm having so um, it's going to be kind of hit or miss until I really get things dialed in but um, if you haven't already been to the website as well um, I put up pictures of the guests so you can kind of put a face behind the voice that you hear uh, which is to me it's a nice little touch um, so yeah I'm on all social media all aboard the dream train um, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook uh, all aboard the dream train.com if you or someone you know has a story they'd like to share um, please reach out to me at all aboard the dream train at gmail.com you can find a link on the website as well um, yeah if you think you have a friend that might dig the podcast or has a story they'd like to share um, please have them reach out to me I'd, I'd love to talk to them and I got some guests coming up that I'm stoked about and some ideas of brewing um, for future episodes. So if you haven't already, uh, subscribe to wherever you listen to podcasts so you don't miss out. I hope everybody has a great Labor Day weekend. Have fun, be safe out there, and we'll party next time.